Good morning, church. Standing in for Brandon this morning. So, um, and I'll be reading scripture, Luke chapter 9, 18 through 25. Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowds say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. He said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Good morning, church. If you're visiting with us, again, we're so glad that you're here and that you're here to experience worship together with us. And today is a special day. We're going to have an installation of new deacons uh, at the end of our service. I uh, hope that you'll stay for that because this is a very special time, uh, not only for them, but for this church family. And I hope that you'll stay uh, and experience that together with us. This morning, before I get started, uh, we, we do have a tradition around here of, of giving uh, recognition to those that is due, especially those that, that serve in our military community. Uh, Airman First Class Trevor LeBay is with us this morning. Uh, Trevor will be headed to Lake and Heath Royal Air Force Base, United Kingdom on Wednesday to serve as a firefighter. But before he heads out, he needed to take care of some very important business uh, this weekend. And so he, uh, he proposed to Alyssa Martinez, who uh, is also a member of this church family, grew up here as well. And so I want to recognize Airman LeBay uh, and the future Mrs. Uh, Alyssa LeBay, if y'all would stand and let us recognize you. <laughs> It is a parent's prerogative to embarrass their children. So I take full advantage of that and responsibility. This morning we continue in our study of the Gospel of Luke. And a lot of people don't realize this, but the truth is, is that the Gospel of Luke is written to one person. It's written to a man named Theophilus. And we really do not know a lot about Theophilus. But Theophilus is believed to have been a high-ranking Roman official. And what we're seeing is, and Luke tells him very, very clearly, this is an eyewitness account of the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. And he's sharing the story of Jesus with this man, Theophilus. And so far, he shared some pretty amazing things about Jesus. But today, in the passage that Bobby read just a moment ago, we, we come to a, 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 a crossroads with Jesus and the Twelve. And he asks the most important question of them, and quite honestly of all of us, that Jesus can ask. He asks this question, who do you say that I am? And so before we get into the message this morning, I'd like for us to join together in prayer to the Lord. Father God, thank you so much for bringing us together today to worship you, to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross of his body and blood, which unites us as believers. We come from many different backgrounds, many different places. We have many different histories that we bring together today as believers, all covered in the blood of Jesus Christ that 
as believers, we experienced when we were covered with that blood symbolically in the waters of baptism. And Lord, today we, we have recognized that body and blood in the communion together as believers, as one family. And we sincerely pray that our recognition and our celebration of that sacrifice and Jesus' resurrection has been pleasing to you. Today, Father, as Mark say, very important day in the history of this church family. We're going to be installing deacons today to, to, to lead ministries and to involve members of this church family in sharing the gospel in this community. And Lord, I pray that, that your hand of guidance will be upon them, Spirit, that you will lead them. And Lord, that we as a church family will love and support them in any way that we can. Lord, today, this message that Luke records asks the most important question that we can answer in this life. Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? It's not just a question that he asked 2,000 years ago. It's a question that he asks each and every believer every day that we live. Spirit, I pray that this message will be your message, that you will speak in a powerful an undeniable way to help us understand who you are, who you are to us, who you want us to share with the world around us. And Father, help us to, to reach daily for that and to grow deeper in that as we continue to be the salt and the light that you've called us to be. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. In the passage that Bobby read just a moment ago, we're told that Jesus was praying. And following his time in prayer, he asks the 12 in verse 18, who do the crowds say that I am? Now, we need to understand something, family. In asking that question, we need to understand that Jesus is not interested in gauging his popularity in the culture. That's not what's driving that question. He is testing the waters, though, and setting the stage for a very important question to follow that one. And the answer to that question, the question that is yet to come for the twelve, the answer to that question would determine whether or not the twelve were ready to move forward in their training as apostles. And so... He asks, who do the people say that I am? Who do the people say that Jesus is? This is the question that has been posed to the twelve. Now when you think about that, consider what they already know about him. He's a carpenter from Nazareth, but he can catch fish like nobody's business. He's the awkward son in a family that really hasn't decided for themselves who he is. But he can cause the wind and the waves to be stilled at his command. To some degree, family, we need to realize that the twelve themselves are still trying to figure out the answer to that question. Who do people say? Who do the crowds say that I am? With regard to everyone else, in verse 19, the 12 said, well, some say that you're John the baptizer, but others say Elijah and others that one of the prophets of old has risen. In other words, what they're telling Jesus is there's all kinds of speculation out there about who you are. Whether it be people in general or the twelve themselves, one thing that everybody understood, everyone understood that there was something special, even prophetic, about Jesus. If the first question to the twelve about how the public viewed Jesus wasn't difficult enough, the one that Jesus was asked, that Jesus asked them next was monumental. Who do you say that I am? Jesus makes it personal. Who do you say that I am? Family, we can learn 
all that is learnable from any library or any commentary about Jesus that has ever been written. And people can ask us who Jesus is. And we can share with them all that we know and all the knowledge that we've obtained regarding him, his life and his ministry. But at the end of the day, brothers and sisters, the most important question that any of us will ever answer is this one. Who do you say that I am? Family, the most important question, the most important question is your view, your personal view of Christ. Is he a wise teacher? Is he a worthy example? Is he a spiritual leader? Is he the Son of God? Is he the Savior who gave his body and his blood to pay the ransom for you personally? Who do you say that I am? Jesus asks you the question. And when he asked this question to the twelve, Peter, Peter was the first one to answer. Are you surprised? Verse 20, as if almost immediately after Jesus asked the question, without hesitation, Peter says, you are the Christ of God. It was the right answer. Peter says, you are the Christ of God. Of God, And what he is saying is that Jesus is the Messiah or the promised one of God that the Old Testament prophets had, had pointed to the one whom Israel was looking for to deliver them. Again, Peter had the right answer. But Theophilus, who's reading this for the first time, Theophilus, like all of us, are somewhat surprised when Luke writes in verse 21, and he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one. I have to believe that when Theophilus read that for the first time, he's scratching his head. Yes, Peter answered Jesus' question regarding his identity correctly, but he and the rest of the twelve had no idea what that meant. To the twelve and nearly every other living Jew, the Messiah was the one who would free Israel from foreign occupation, which happened to be at this time the Roman Empire. You see, they had come to believe that the Messiah or the Greek, which is the Christ, would be an earthly king. And this earthly king was going to restore Israel to material and military power on the world scene. Not only did they have an inaccurate view of what the Messiah was, family, they also had to understand that God's timing was just as important as having the right information. So announcing that Jesus was the Messiah would have led to political chaos at this time. It would have led to violence. It would have led to unneeded suffering. It would have led, family, to a distortion of the gospel message. This is why Jesus told them, Shh, don't tell anybody. Family, the twelve needed to know. The twelve needed to know why Jesus had come. They had to begin to wrap their heads around that before he could command them to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And so with this knowledge that Jesus is in fact the Messiah, the question now is what does it mean to be his disciple? Family, that's a question we have to ask. The twelve are asking themselves that question, right? Well, what does this mean? What does it mean to be his disciple? You and I have to ask that question every day. What does it mean to you personally to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? 
The twelve now understand from his own lips that Jesus was the promised Messiah. Now they needed to realize the true nature of what the Messiah was supposed to be. And so in verse 22, Jesus says this. He says, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Family, take a good look at that. Look at what Jesus says to the twelve. Because I can tell you right now, that right there that you see on the screen is nothing like what the twelve expected to hear from the mouth of the Messiah. What Jesus says right there shatters their expectation and every other Jew's expectation of what the Messiah was to be. That did not figure into their narrative at all. Family, they thought the the Messiah was going to appear for a coronation, not a cross. Jesus tells them that he has not come to build an earthly empire, but a spiritual kingdom. Verse 22, Jesus paints a pretty dark picture, but a crystal clear picture of what was to transpire. He tells them that he will suffer many things. He tells them that he will be rejected by the leaders of Israel. He tells them that he will be killed. But he also tells them that he will be resurrected on the third day. Family, this is something that the theologians of Israel had missed. They missed it. And subsequently, everyone who learned the scriptures from them missed it, including the twelve. They had missed what Isaiah said about the suffering servant, at least in connection with the Messiah. They didn't make that connection. Because this would have totally and completely blown what they envisioned the Messiah to be. You see, Jesus sets out to help the twelve and those who would listen to him to see the big picture. That the prophets and the teachers of the law had missed. And this was such a shock to the twelve. I mean, this was devastating. This was devastating to twelve, especially Peter. In Matthew's account of the event, you remember Peter pulls Jesus aside and he rebukes Jesus, the Savior, the Son of God in front of everybody. He says, far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. And take a good look at that. Look what Peter said to Jesus. Let me tell you something. Peter's having a hard time with this. He's having a very hard time wrapping his head around some very devastating news. And he has turned his concept. Jesus has turned Peter's concept of the Messiah on its ear. And he says to Jesus, in effect, man, I can't believe it. And then in verse 23, Jesus turns to Peter. And he looks him right in the face. And he brings down the hammer of reality for Peter and the twelve when he says, get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on things of God, but on the things of man. Look at the screen. Jesus pegged it pretty good, didn't he? You're not setting your mind on the big plan, Peter. You're not setting your mind on what reality is. You have your mind set on the lie. You have your mind set on what you thought the Messiah was to be. Family, the lie that's, that from Satan that the Messiah would be an earthly power broker had been perpetuated by the Jewish culture for centuries. And you know what? Pride will do that to you. Pride will do that to you. 
Whether it be as an individual or whether it be as a nation, pride will do that to you. And family, we can be fooled and we can be misled by Satan's manipulation of our pride to believe just about anything. And now Jesus metaphorically slaps Peter in the face and sets him straight by saying, you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Family Peter and the twelve and the rest of Jewish culture had a Messiah box. And they thought they could squeeze Jesus into their Messiah box. And let me tell you something, they were wrong. They were wrong. And now that they, at the expense of Peter, have been redirected to what it means to be his disciple, now the question is, what does it cost? What does it cost to be Jesus' disciple? Family, like Peter and the Twelve, it's important for you and I to understand something. It's important that we understand the role of the Messiah in our life. You need to understand the role of Jesus in your life because it changes the way that we follow Him. At this point, the twelve had either bought fully into the Jewish cultural definition of the Messiah. They'd either bought in to the lie or they were still trying to make up their mind. At this point, Jesus has cleared the board. He has completely and totally cleared the board and has unmistakably laid out not only who he is, but what he's about. And the reason why, family, their expectations of holding cabinet positions and ambassadorships in his empire is fading is because he needs them to know that following him will not be easy. It won't be easy, and it will come at a cost. And while they're pondering all this in their mind, and this was a shocking moment for them. This was culture shock for them. This, this, this was devastating for them. While they're pondering all this in their mind, as their old idea of the Messiah is crumbling and giving away to what Jesus has just told them regarding himself as the Messiah, Jesus lays verse 23 on them. And it had to hit them hard. Jesus said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Take a good look at that. Let that sink in. If I'm not mistaken, this is the first time that Jesus has brought the cross into the picture. Think about how devastating that was for the twelve. And if I'm Peter, or I'm one of the twelve, then you have to be thinking, wow, you got to be kidding me. We've left everything. We've been through amazing things, incredible things. I'm just beginning to wrap my head around the fact, you are the Messiah, and now you're going to die? You're going to go to a cross? And not only that, you're asking me to pick one up and follow you. I mean, look at what Jesus says right there. He's telling the twelve, if you want to follow me, You can't take the next step until you sign off on these three requirements. In effect, what Jesus is saying, it's put up or shut up time, fellas. Either you're in or you're out. What's it going to be? Family, right there in verse 23, Jesus lays out the basic formula for being the disciple that he's called us to be. And he says we had to do three things. We must do three things. First, we must deny ourselves. In our culture, that ain't easy. But we must deny ourselves. And to deny ourselves is to set aside our passions, to set aside our desires, to set aside the need for getting our way and submitting to his will. 
And we do this daily. We are called to do this daily. Family, no one said it was going to be easy. It most certainly is easier said than done. And in order to do this, family, we must surrender ourselves to be led by someone else. Second, we must take up our cross. Family, taking up our cross means that we have resolved ourselves. We have come to the fully invested decision. We have resolved ourselves to suffer whatever it takes to faithfully serve the Lord. And here's the thing. Don't miss this. Not everyone's cross is the same. Not everybody's cross is the same, family. We'd like to think that it is, but it isn't. And when we see someone else carrying their cross, it appears to be lighter or appears to be a little bit more attractive than the cross that we carry. Sometimes we let that get the best of us. And we then are guilty of not denying ourselves the envy and the jealousy that blurs our spiritual vision and focus. Sometimes we're guilty of adjusting our faith to our life rather than adjusting our life to the commitment that we've made to Christ. Family, our cross is our cross. And no one can carry mine for me. And no one can carry yours for you. And either we decide to carry our own cross family daily and faithfully, or we don't carry it at all. This is the cost of the cross that we all signed up for. If you're a believer here today, you signed up for that. As soon as you walked into the baptistry to die to yourself, to be buried in the blood of Jesus Christ, to be joined with the Holy Spirit, and to be resurrected to a new life, that is what you and I signed up for. And Jesus calls us to submit all of our life to Him, regardless of the cost. Third, Jesus calls us to follow Him. You know, we really can't do that. We cannot follow Jesus unless we've already made the commitment to deny ourselves and to pick up our cross. And in the structure of the language of the command that Jesus gives, that is exactly what Jesus is saying. When he says you must first deny yourself and take up your cross, in the structure of the language, those two commands are past tense imperatives. He follows that up with a present tense imperative. Follow me. And this is intended to be a constant. So in essence, what Jesus is saying, family, is that we must have already decided to deny ourselves. We must have already decided to take up our cross daily before we can follow him. And all of this goes back, all of this goes back to the question, who do you say that I am? Family, we say who Jesus is to us and how we deny ourselves and in how we carry our cross. Take a good, hard look at what's on the screen right now, family. Let that soak in. How's that been working for you lately? What does that look like in your life? Have you had a hard time saying no? Have you struggled with denying yourself? Have you had a hard time saying no? Have you dropped your cross? Family, it's important that we answer that. And no one can explain it better than Jesus does in verses 24 and 25. Listen to what he says. 
He says, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Three questions. First, what is more important than your soul? Second, why would you choose to live for the moment if it will put your soul at risk? Family, those two questions right there are ones that people spend a whole lot of time in this life struggling with and worrying about. And the reason why is because they haven't settled the third question that Jesus asks of all of us. Who do you say that I am? Look at what Jesus asks of you and me. Have you settled that question in your heart and in your mind to this morning? Are you having a hard time saying no? Have you dropped your cross and you need to pick it back up? We have an opportunity to pick our cross up again. If you need us to pray with you, to pray for you, now's the time. It's not something to be ashamed of. We're human. There's nobody in this room that can condemn you. That's above all of our pay grade. If you need to be prayed over, to be loved, to be accepted, to be encouraged, to pick up your cross and continue walking with Jesus, we want to pray with you and we want to pray for you. If you need to do that for the first time, you're ready to confess that Jesus is the Son of God, the Son of the living God, your Savior, your Lord, your King, and you're ready to turn your life over Him, repent of your sins, and die to yourself in baptism to have your sins washed away, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and to arise to a brand new life. Today's the day. Man, don't put it off any longer. We want to experience that with you. If you're visiting with us this morning and you're looking for a church home, we hope you found it because we want you here. In fact, we need you here. We're not perfect, and we'll love you, but we'll love you the best that we can, and we'll put you to work. Whatever your need is this morning, do not miss this opportunity to respond to the Lord together while we stand and sing.